Hello everyone. In these difficult times, when everything around is getting more expensive, finding good and original electronic components for DIY radio projects at a low price is not an easy task. For this reason, many radio enthusiasts, including myself, disassemble all sorts of unnecessary equipment for parts. But in most modern devices, dense SMD mounting is used, and many components are specialized and have no application in amateur radio practice. Take, for example, an old burnout video card. What can you take from it? The heat sink, and even that is non-standard. You can't just stick it anywhere. Some might say that in the era of mining, tearing apart a card is sacrilege. As an amateur radio enthusiast, I fundamentally disagree with this, because mining is the source of many troubles. It is precisely because of mining that many hardware components have not only become several times more expensive, but have also completely disappeared from the shelves. And as you might have guessed, today I will be shortening a graphics card, but with a good purpose, aiming to reuse some of its components. I'll say right away, that this graphics card was in a computer that was gifted to me a long time ago, by my subscriber Pavel. At that time, it was top-notch hardware. Three years ago, the card's fans broke. I tried everything I could, until about a year ago, but it finally burned out completely. It's a GTX 560T from MSI. And even now, it's still not bad, but the video chip itself is burned out. And who knows what else? Restoration, in my particular case, is not practical because the card is outdated, and my main computer has a much more powerful one. Restoring this card, for example, for sale is also not relevant. I'd rather make a video for you and earn from the advertisement, which is coming up right now. As you might have noticed, it's already been slightly scavenged by me. In reality, there's not much you can take from it. If you are involved in their repair, the card can be used as a donor, but for an ordinary, hobbyist, there's little of interest here. The chip itself and the memory won't be particularly useful. Therefore, we are only interested in what comes before these components. Almost any device includes a power supply. For video cards, especially relatively modern ones, this power supply is very interesting. In fact, these are multi-phase power converters that have very high efficiency due to synchronous conversion and a bunch of various protections. Currents of tens of amperes flow through these small transistors. And to understand how and why they don't burn out, let's dolder a few of these switches and study them in more detail. Believe it or not, but for example, this transistor can effortlessly, without even heating up much, handle currents up to 35 amperes. Let's take a look at the technical documentation of the switch, P0403VK. This is an n-channel field effect transistor with a drain source voltage of 30 volts and a current of 35 amperes. At the same time, its on-state resistance is only 4 milliohms. If we look at some graphs, we'll notice that such a low on-state resistance can be achieved by applying a gate voltage starting from about 6 volts, although 10 volts are needed for full turn-on. Considering its voltage characteristics, this switch is perfect for making car DIY projects with a 12-volt power supply. For example, the so-called ideal diode, it works almost like a regular diode. So what's the deal, and why not use ordinary diodes? To start with, Ohm's law. The resistance of the open channel of our switch is 4 milliohms or 0 0.004 ohms. When a current of, say, 10 amperes flows through it, the power dissipated on the transistor is only 0.4 watts. Yes, I know, there will be comments saying that this is not an ideal diode, but just reverse polarity protection. An ideal diode based on a MOSFET, as a controller that monitors the input signal and opens or closes the switch at the right time. Of course, you are all partly right, but in reality, the term ideal diode can refer to a whole family of diodes on MOSFET transistors from simple ones like this to quite complex ones. They can be unidirectional, bidirectional, for protective purposes, for use in synchronous rectifiers, and so on. I will someday explain in detail all the varieties of such diodes and show how they work. And yes, any modern diode, including the so-called ideal one, is actually far from the theoretical ideal diode. A small aluminum plate as a heatsink or a power tin polygon of the printed circuit board itself, on which the switch is installed, and voila! You have a very efficient diode. It should be noted that besides the switch itself, there are a few more components in the circuit. A gate, 
current limiter, a Zener diode, to protect the gate from overvoltage, and a small capacitor. If we take, for example, a Schottky diode, which is known for having the lowest voltage drop, and compare it with our switch, we will notice the following. Using the example of a 30 amp diode assembly MBR3045, the manufacturer specifies that when a current of 10 amps flows, the voltage drop across the diode will be about 0.4 volts. And this, no matter how you look at it, is about 4 watts of thermal loss, which is almost 10 times higher than in the case of our ideal diode. By the way, transistors can have much lower on state resistance, as low as 1 milliohm or less. Synchronous rectifiers are built on this principle, which are actively used in relatively new and expensive computer power supplies and beyond. The same transistor or a series of such transistors connected in parallel can be used as a solid state relay. Apply a gate voltage through a low power button, the transistor opens and controls a powerful load. Moreover, the losses, as in the first case, are minimal. Such a relay can easily turn on and off, say, car headlights and other loads. Moreover, in the case of working with commutator motors, it is mandatory to protect the circuit with a unit that shields the switch from back EMF. The main advantage of a solid state relay, besides high efficiency, is its virtually unlimited lifespan. There are no moving parts, and therefore, it is more resistant to mechanical impact. There is also no risk of contact burning. There are simply no contacts here. On graphics card boards, you can find small sources that generate secondary voltage. They are usually also built on synchronous, topology in half, high efficiency. The UP1529 chip caught my eye here. It is the same as the AT1529, I initially thought. It's a very interesting chip in an SOP8 package, which is a synchronous step-down DC-DC converter. The efficiency claimed by the manufacturer can reach up to 94%. Despite its modest size, it can provide an output, current of up to 3.2 amperes, and operates at a frequency of 1 MHz. These types of chips come with a range of protections, such as protection against short circuits, overload, overheating, and excessive input voltage. I assembled it, started it up, and the result was zero. Nothing works. I sat there, with this converter, tinkered with it for half an hour, and all without results. No reference voltage, no generation. Everything is not as in the documentation. Well, that's kind of strange. There's no other documentation for the chip, and it should be it. Then, I glanced at the card's board and saw a couple of power switches near the chip. 1529, they are not here for nothing. The chip was controlling them. Delving into the depths of the internet, I stumbled upon a Chinese forum with blurry pictures. I followed some links and realize that up 1529 and at 1529 are not the same. I never did find the technical documentation. But here, a Chinese person, most likely, provides the RT8120 chip as an equivalent. And it's easy to find technical documentation for it. Now this seems more like the truth. This chip is a controller and gate driver for a synchronous converter and, considering that it has a fairly wide, range of supply voltages. It can be used, for example, in automotive technology. You can extract as much current as you want by using external switches. The operating frequency is 300 kHz. Naturally, it provides all necessary protections. Of course, it's a damn shame, but most likely, my abuse was too much for the chip to handle. Otherwise, I would gladly assemble a similar converter and demonstrate its capabilities. Anything can happen in life but I apologize for such an incident. The third design I won't be able to demonstrate in operation anymore. The video card is rich in components. That can be used in everyday DIY projects, but it is a source of small parts. It has a lot of fairly capacious ceramic capacitors that will be useful for high current pulse circuits to smooth out power ripples. There are many tantalum, solid state low voltage capacitors, and that's about it. Specialized gate drivers, buses, and other components are very specific and considering. Due to the size of their housings and the range of operating voltages, they cannot be used everywhere.
Of course, this is just a small fraction of what a non-working video card can be converted into. I also wanted to show a spot welding design based on these transistors, but I already have a lot of welders, so I'll refrain this time. Don't forget to leave your feedback. Subscribe to my other resources, and you can find additional information, as always, in the video description. Well, that's all from me. As always, this was Kazyanov K, and until next time, bye.